Welcome back again. We're going to talk here in lecture four on the endocrine system um, about a little bit more about how hormone levels are controlled in the body. And again, we're talking in more general terms here as we move through specific hormones produced by particular endocrine glands. We'll hear in more detail about how the levels of particular hormones are controlled. Okay, so hormones are made by endocrine glands, so it stands to reason if uh, the cells in the endocrine gland are producing, making, and secreting more of the hormone, the levels of that hormone are going to be higher in your body fluids. If it's making less of the hormone, then the hormone levels are going to be lower in your body fluids. And um, as we go through the endocrine system, you're going to see that um, hormone levels tend to be controlled by negative feedback systems. And that's where they're kept not necessarily at a constant level there in the center, but there is an average normal level of a particular hormone that you try to maintain in your body fluids. But in reality, the levels go up and they go back down. They go up and they go back down. They go up and they go back down, um, as occurs with many different bodily uh, substances and processes that are controlled by homeostasis. So they tend to vary only within narrow desirable ranges, um, assuming you are producing that hormone at normal levels. Okay, so your endocrine glands, you know, what stimulates them, what tells them to produce more of a hormone? It differs for different endocrine glands and the hormones they make. In some cases, they are controlled by humoral stimuli. Humoral is, a, is based on an older term, humor, uh, not meaning sense of humor or funny here, but body humors. Those were types of bodily fluids. That is um, very old terminology. There were four body humors that the body was believed to be composed of, um, going way back to ancient Greek times before people really understood anything about the anatomy of the human body. Those were called the body humors. So humoral refers to body fluids and substances in your body fluids. So here, humoral stimuli um, is really referring to you know, some type of molecule or molecules that are floating around diffusing in your body fluids. Neural stimuli, in some cases, the nervous system um, controls whether or not endocrine glands produce particular hormones. And then finally, hormonal stimuli. Hormonal stimuli is really kind of a type of humoral stimuli, but it's just specifically referring to hormones, particular hormones floating around in your body fluids that tell other endocrine glands to make more of a particular hormone, or in some cases it could be less of a particular hormone. That's referred to as hormonal stimuli. So that can be a little bit difficult to think about for a minute. Sometimes hormones tell other endocrine glands to make different hormones. All right, so here's an example of a humoral stimulus. Um, this is a diagram, we'll be talking more about this later, but these little, this is the thyroid gland, hopefully you recognize that. On the back side, posterior side of the thyroid, you have either three or four of these little glands called parathyroid glands, and again, we'll be learning more about those later. The parathyroid glands make a hormone called PTH, and they make that in response to changing levels of calcium ions, Ca with a two plus double positive charge. Low calcium levels in your body fluids is a stimulus, those are a stimulus that tell your parathyroid glands to secrete PTH. Okay, so this is an example of a humoral stimulus because these calcium ions, which are floating around in your body fluids, are the trigger for production of this particular hormone. And again, we'll be seeing the details of this when we talk more specifically about PTH. Helps control the calcium levels in your body. Well, you guys hopefully learned about PTH when you covered the skeletal system in biology. 201. It's very uh, important for helping to maintain proper calcium levels in your body fluids. All right, then how about neural stimulus? 
sometimes neurons with their little axons extending outward toward an endocrine gland um, actually control or stimulate secretion of hormones. And the best example of this would be the medulla, the, that's the central portion of your adrenal glands, and we'll be hearing more about that later. Um, the adrenal medulla makes epinephrine and norepinephrine. Now, in, um, when you study the nervous system, you learn that norepinephrine is a type of neurotransmitter that is secreted by some of the neurons um, of your autonomic nervous system, if you guys remember that, the sympathetic branch of your autonomic nervous system. Um, but also you have cells in your adrenal glands that produce that hormone and also the closely related epinephrine as well in larger amounts and they get into your bloodstream and travel all throughout your, all throughout your body. But it's actually signaling from the nervous system that triggers production of those hormones in the adrenal medulla. All right, and then hormonal stimuli, and we're going to see various examples of this. Sometimes hormones are released in response to another hormone. There's a term for a, tr a tropic, it's tropic, not tropic, spelled the same as tropic, but it's pronounced tropic. A tropic hormone is one that stimulates secretion of another hormone. Okay, so its target, the target of a tropic hormone is another endocrine gland. All right, so for example, your hypothalamus, as we're going to see, secretes a number of different hormones that act on the anterior pituitary. They uh, travel the short distance from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary and tell the anterior pituitary to make various hormones. And then um, many of those hormones then get into your bloodstream. They travel around the body and they tell other endocrine glands to make the hormones they're programmed to make. For example, the thyroid, the adrenal cortex, that's another portion of the adrenal glands we'll be learning about, or the gonads, testes and the ovaries respond to hormones that are made by the anterior pituitary. So we'll see several different examples of hormones triggering the secretion or production of other hormones. All right, so hormones travel in your bloodstream. That's how they circulate throughout the body. But then keep in mind, you know, yes, they're in your blood vessels, but they can move out, they move back in, um, because the fluids in your bloodstream um, move out into the uh, extracellular fluids, the interstitial fluids, your tissue fluids that bathe your cells, and those fluids can also move back into your blood vessels as well. So they're moving back and forth. Um, your water-soluble hormones are just dissolved in your body fluids because they love the water in your body fluids. So they're dissolved in your body fluids just like things um, like glucose and amino acids and ions are other things that like water. Your steroid hormones, those are hydrophobic lipid lovers, and thyroid hormones are actually also lipid loving, they're um, hydrophobic, which means they don't, they can't dissolve in your body fluids. So they're actually carted around or transported around attached to particular plasma proteins. Oh, plasma, by the way, um, if you haven't heard that term before, plasma is your blood fluid. That's the watery-based fluid in your blood. Blood is made up of cells and plasma, the fluid portion. So those plasma proteins are sometimes called carriers. Stylus is not working there too well. Carriers, because they carry or help shuttle or transport these particular hormones throughout your body fluids. Um, all right, the concentration. So what's really important about whether or not a, uh, one of the key things that's critical about whether or not a hormone is gonna be able to 
cause any effects on its targets is its concentration. How many molecules of that hormone do you have in a particular volume of body fluid? So that concentration is what goes up and down and fluctuates. And um, you know that concentration reflects the rate of release, how fast is the endocrine gland making it and secreting it. Um, then also these hormone molecules don't last forever just like anything else in your um, body. They're, it's, they're going to wear out, they're going to be inactivated, they're going to be removed from your body just like um, other substances are. So how fast does that happen? How fast are your hormones inactivated or removed from the body? Remember when you learned about neurotransmitters when you studied the nervous system? Uh, those neurotransmitter molecules tend to be broken down very, very quickly. You have enzymes in the synaptic clefts there in those little spaces between um, the two cells at the synapse that break those neurotransmitters down. That helps ensure that uh, once neurotransmitters are made, they just don't keep causing their effects over and over and over and over and over again. You want to very tightly control those types of things. Same deal with hormones. Once you secrete them, you don't want them always being there and building up and building up and building up in concentration. The body very tightly controls the concentration. And then how does that happen? Um, in some cases, like what you guys learned about with neurotransmitters, you have specific enzymes that break them down. The kidneys We'll learn more about the kidneys towards the end of the class, but the kidneys filter the blood and remove substances that no longer need to be in the blood so that you will urinate those out of the body. That's the job of the kidney. So a lot of hormones are removed from your bloodstream through the kidneys. And then the liver also. Cells in the liver take up hormones and break them down um, as needed. Different hormones have different half-lives. Um, you may have heard that term before. Sometimes you hear that with regard to radioactivity. Um, but hormones and other types of molecules in the body have half-lives as well. Or you might hear about the half-lives of drugs. When you learn about drugs, if you're going into nursing school or pharmacy school, you'll hear about half-lives. That's the amount of time it takes for the concentration of a hormone to drop by half. So it's not like all of the copies of a particular hormone um, self-destruct together all at the same time. The levels of a particular hormone tend to gradually drop over time. And so the amount of time it takes for the concentration to drop by half is called the half-life. So you might have a concentration of 1,000 milligrams per milliliter. Um, and 30 minutes later, that drops down to 500. And then 30 minutes later, that drops down to 250. And then 30 minutes later, it's down to 125. 30 minutes would be the half-life of that particular hormone. For different hormones, that half-life can be a fraction of a minute. It can disappear very quickly, kind of like a neurotransmitter would. Those are very quickly cleared away from the synapses in the nervous system, or in other cases, up to a week. Some hormones take a week for their concentrations to drop by half. So there's a lot of variety within the endocrine system that occurs. All right, so that's the, uh, the end of the kind of general broad overview about hormones and um, what they do, how they function. And so now for the rest of the unit, we're going to uh, talk more specifically about particular endocrine glands the hormones that they make, the targets and the effects of those hormones. And then as I mentioned before, one of the probably the most interesting aspect of the endocrine system is learning about the disorders that are associated when you either make too much of a hormone, you don't make enough, or maybe your cells aren't responding to a particular hormone properly. So with the fifth lecture, we're going to start talking about the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. They have a very intimate relationship with each other and we'll be uh, start talking about that in the fifth video lecture for this unit.